out here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week is going to be the turn of the Welsh bass band. It is the sweetest ache because I recently spoke to their guitarist and songwriter. It's the one and only Peter Stone. To find out more about life, love and poetry, one-time members or on the famous record label, Sarah Records. So this is the interview, so after several minutes of interesting but casual chat, we got down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years, the musical awakening. Anyway, Peter, it's over to you. Well, yes, I suppose I was the youngest of four, so my brother was into sort of like punk and new wave, but also Slade, Bowie, so he's 60. And then my sisters, who were both older than me, were into things like David Essex and stuff. But my first ever album I bought was like Never Mind the Bee by the Sex Pistols. Oh, um, right. So I remember buying that. I think it was probably, I was born in 1968. And I think I probably bought it about age 11 um, from, my mum used to take me to Virgin Records, which was in Swansea. And um, I, I just sort of idolised the punks and stuff. So that was my first ever album. Yes. My second album was That's Life by Sham 69. Oh, and my third, my third album was Sandinista by The Clash. Um, my first ever single was Number One Song in Heaven by Sparks. Oh, that's very uh, so, very tasteful. <laughs> that whole yeah. lot, really. There's nothing there. Were your parents at all kind of musical, or did they no, have well, musical um, kind of kind of excitement about them, or did they? My father wasn't really around because my mum and dad they'd split up. My mum was into things like, um, well, theatre and shows and stuff. Um, so she'd have things like My Fair Lady album and she'd have things like, I don't know, Frank Sinatra albums, which, I mean, she's passed away now, but I inherited. So I got a lovely little collection all on the old Capital label of lots and lots of lovely albums and stuff. Um, so she wasn't massively into music. My brother would make a, a compilation cassettes and stuff and he'd throw in loads of stuff like Bowie or like Queen, the Sat and the other, and everything he was listening to. And she'd like a little bit of Fleetwood Mac. I remember she liked Primal Scream Stars, um, which I thought was rather nice. And I remember buying Nick Cave, The Good Son album, and she really liked The Good Son album. And she's like, well, who's this then? And I said, it's Nick Cave. Well, I've never heard Nick Cave. And I said, I've bought all his albums up to up to scratch, and this is the new album. And she said, well, this is really very nice. And I remember I had to put it on to cassette so we could play it in the car. And I was a bit like, oh, that's quite cool. Mum likes Nick Cave. So, <laughs> you know. Yes. That's very sweet, actually. That is a nice touch, yeah, actually. Sweet. And I guess with that age generation, my my parents, I think it, in a way, from that kind of very kind of working class background, they were born just before the war. And so yeah. during the 50s, late 50s, when they, you know, got married and, and got a a bungalow together um i think they just they 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 were that generation that never had any debt they would they would refuse to borrow money so they yeah. would just go without and then save money and then buy that thing and so i think yeah. when they got married um they just sold everything including the records and the record player yeah. so my dad quite liked elvis but by then he didn't have a any of those records and he liked country and western but really terrible country and western music yeah. um but then in the early 70s you know a record player appeared in the house and 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 there was a few records that they bought which were pretty awful but then my brother who was seven years older he was into that prog rock world so he had the you know yeah. yes and genesis i had a uh, huge um, best uh, i had a, a huge yes so this like my fourth album was black sabbath volume one brilliant and then ACDC, If You Want Blood. And then I kind of went into a bit of a yes thing. And then I went off in a bit of a sort of prog, proggy era. of, And like I incorporated like Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and early Rush before they were all keyboard heavy. And that then sort of took us up to about 1983, 84, when watching Top of the Pops, this charming man, the Smiths came on. And Everything and I'd had really long hair. I mean, my hair's quite long again now, but I'd had long hair. I suddenly cut my hair, I got a quiff, 
I went out and I bought loads of the Smiths 12 inches. I bought the album. And then that opened to the door to like Echo and the Bunny Man, The Cure, um, Southern Get Death Cult. And it, and it, I just kind of stayed on that path. I do revisit my sort of like rock and prog, you know, days. But um, and then I suppose it, indie pop kicked in then with like the blur and, and the pulp and I don't know, loads of stuff. Spiritualized Spaceman 3, My Bloody Valentine, Sonic. Yes. It you was, know, and, um, and luckily I got to see all those bands. Um, uh-huh. I went to 12 Glastonbury's and I went to about seven Reading festivals. So I saw an awful lot of bands um, and I got the photos and the memories and stuff. So it's great. <laughs> That's really good, actually, because yeah. I, I did an interview with the, a member of Gay Bikers on Acid the other oh, day. Oh, I love the Gay Bikers. And uh, to be honest, I think they took so many drugs. He didn't really have many memories of what they did during that period. <laughs> oh, I remember. I remember I, I sneaked in to 11 Glastonbury's and I paid for one and it cost me £28. Nice. That's and I very think that good. was like 1986. And we right. everyone would just sneak in. There'd be a little sign saying no unauthorised entry. So you just walk through it and next minute you'd just be in the field. And I think one of the first bands I ever saw was World Party. And right. they were like really good. And I bought the Ship of Fools album or whatever I bought. And and then it, it was just like Ride, My Bloody Valentine. I remember being in maybe 95, seeing like Supergrass, Pulp, Blur, Oasis, you know, in their prime, Super Fury Animals. And just like, this is just the best ever. Yes. And um, I don't know. And it's just a huge part of my life. It's my whole life, really. I I have re- I, I do buy from indie shops. I will buy from eBay or Discogs if I have to. But every Friday I finish work at half four and I go to my local shop and I buy something. And I've done that for about, oh, my God, 35 years. <laughs> oh, that is, uh, yes, well, no, it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a good addiction to have, really. So yeah, when you I got to... The mid eighties, then. So you left. You said you were born. So that was that. You were like fifteen when you know you first saw the Smiths in eighty yeah. eighty three. So does that I was mean born in nineteen sixty eight? So I was about sixteen when I saw them in Swansea University. Right. So um, then, did you leave school at sixteen? Yeah, I did two years of catering. I did all sorts of things then in colleges and stuff. Yes. Um, my God, loads, actually. Like, I did catering, I did psychology, sociology, electronics. Um, I never really knew what I wanted to do, to be honest. But all I wanted to do was play guitar and listen to music. Yes. So and, when did you know, when did when did you get a guitar? Um, well, I bought my first guitar, which is a 12 string, which is actually in the attic because it's not that great, from John Ham, as in Peter Ham from Bad Finger. Um, the band um, round about fifteen, you, and then so my did, father. Did you, did you say you bought it from his brother? From, so Pete, from John Ham was the local Swansea um, music shop, and John Ham was the uh, the brother of Peter Ham from. As in, he wrote um, "Can't Live If Living With Is Out You," and you know the the band Bad Finger, who was signed to the Apple label. So this is the most one of the most. There's a lot actually. One of the most tragic stories oh, in, I know. In, in history, isn't it? I've it's, got the book. It's got, and it is just tear jerkingly yeah. bad, isn't it? It's terrible. It's, it's called "Without You: The Tragic Story of Bad Finger," and two of them hang themselves, and two of them, and George Harrison was trying to help, and Paul McCartney was trying to help, and all these people were trying to help, and then suddenly, then Harry Nilsson has a huge hit with "Living," you know, "Without You," and they don't get any royalties. And it really is. And you read it. I had it for my 30th birthday from one of my best mates. And I've still got it now. And it's worth an absolute fortune. It's a really, really expensive book now if you look on eBay and stuff. Oh, no. Right. Because yeah. that's a real shame because, you know, you kind of wish they just kind of reprint it and leave it. Oh, I know. I know. Yes, it's terrible. But I do remember that story. And I just could not quite comprehend it. It was just like, oh, I know. God. They, um, sorry, so when you mentioned Bad Finger, it sort of triggered this kind of memory of these. Oh, I know. This kind of like awful story. I mean, I did an interview with Les from Bay City Rollers, and that was horrendous. As oh, well. wow. So, um, yeah, because he, he finished when he finished the band, it was like, okay, I'm done now. I can't do it anymore. And it's like 
no money. <laughs> it was like, uh, but where's the money? It's like, we, we've we been huge. It's like, this does no money. Well, they were huge, weren't they? You they know? were massive. And they weren't just big in the UK. They were big all over the world. So that I think, know. So, um, but it was like, no, there's no money. <laughs> it was like, Ah, okay. uh, no. I think I think punk and new wave just pushed a lot of easy listening rock bands to one side, and they never really got it back, did they? Well, the manager got all the money, and he oh, uh, there was that, was there? No, it was the manager who totally sort of did them in, so that was bad. So look, you bought your twelve string guitar yes. from Ham Music, yeah, um, relative brother of of Bad Fingers, you know, yes, the Ham. Yes, yeah. and yeah. that, but not God twelve string. That was a kind of a big one to start. Yeah, with. I think. Yeah, I just bought it. Uh, you know, and I learned. I, you know, I've got my God. I got. I'm in my music room now, actually, and I've got a handful of songbooks all over, all over the place of songbooks because I actually teach guitar as a little sideline. Right. Um, yeah, but then for my 18th birthday, my father bought me a really nice guitar and a really nice amp. So, um, and then I got into a band and we were rehearsing in a place called Uplands, which is about five miles away from where I live now. And we were just, we were like a Jesus and Mary chain, kind of like Huskadoo, punky pop song. I'd written all the songs, playing all the guitar parts. And there was a knock on the door by this really tall guy who used to be in the poo sticks. And which one? Uh, um, Stuart, Stuart Vincent. Right. And he said, you all right? And I went, yeah, all right. He said, I, I'm not going to swear. He said, you're not a very good band. He said, but I quite like your guitar playing. And I was like, oh, okay. And he said, we're in a band and we want to make some demos and we're quite serious. Do you want to come in as second guitar player? So I had a couple of jams with them and I thought, well, they are a bit serious and they're a little bit downbeat, but I'll have a go. And then we were just making all these tiny little cassettes of little demo songs. And then, of course, the Sarah label picked us up. And Matt and Claire said, well, you can do two songs, see how they sell. And then if things go well, you can do an album and then we'll just go from there. So we were like, oh, my God. So we were really, like, really excited. So um, we we went to Vaughn's recording studio in London. On our way to our first ever recording session, we'd just got over the River Seven, pulling in by Avon. And Bob, the driver, said, guys, we're going to have to get out. And we were like, why? And he said, the van's on fire. So we were like, <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, my mum then, the police came, the fire brigade came, and there was like no mobile phones in those days, you know, in the 90s. No. Anyway, we got we got to the recording studio, and luckily we, we laid down the four tracks quite nicely and um, did the artwork and stuff, and they released them. And we got Enemy, gave them quite nice reviews. John Peel played them which was lovely. And then they said, do you want to make an album? So we were like, yeah, okay. So we made an album, God, which was great. A, that was amazing. Just going yeah. back slightly, what, what year was your first Glastonbury, by the way? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, right. Okay. It must be around about 1986. Right. So there was a few years when there weren't any. Yeah. I think I stopped going around about 91, 92. But I just remember there was 12. There was a huge posse of us. And we'd go every year. So it was whenever World Party were playing. That was my first ever Glastonbury. I went with my good friend Martin. Um, and we just like, we thumbed, we hitched from Mumbles where I live. And these two girls in a VW camper pulled in. They said, where are you going, boys? And we said, Glastonbury. And they said, your luck said. And they gave us a left right to the door. And then we sort of like walked around and then we sneaked in. And Blimey. I remember going into the field with, with my pal and my little rucksack and World Party were playing round about two in the afternoon or four in the afternoon. So that was the first one, right. to my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, because I went to the, I went to, my first one was 87, so I was, I was curious. And Huskadoo were playing on right. the on the Friday afternoon and I got there just too late because I thought they were, I thought they were this huge band and it was like, ah, oh. but... Um, New Day Rising and... Um, Zen and, and stuff. Yeah, but I I sort of it was after Candy Apple Grey and then the oh, Warehouse okay. album and those yeah so and I thought oh they're huge you know they're going to be massive they'll be you know like in the evening and it was like who, they've already been and gone. It's uh, who else played in 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 that year? Well, New Order were playing. The yeah, I saw New Order. 
the Bun the Bundy boys were playing. I remember I seeing them because I, I remember John Peel was a big fan. I can't quite remember who else actually. I mean, it was funny. It was, I think the next year I went, it was people like Elvis Costello and yeah, I um, saw him. Was it just him and his guitar? Well, it started with him just playing, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm really disappointed. And then after about half an hour or 20 minutes the curtains came back and the attractions were there ah, and okay. it was just like this brilliant gig and it was like oh my this is amazing i just I'm absolutely love this i love Elvis. i love Elvis Costello. yeah so he you know during that period he was fantastic and susan vega played one year i mean right. there was all those and there was always van morrison and robert cray and people i saw like i saw van morrison he was quite grumpy yeah, I decided I was not going to bother with Yeah, I probably Bandama. wouldn't have seen... I appreciate Robert Cray as a guitar player, but not my cup of tea. He's a bit samey, isn't it, the blues? Yes, a I mean, polished. yeah, that's a complete sweeping statement, but you're <laughs> yeah. true. It's like, I did go and see a few legends, and it was like, I'm a bit bored. But then, you know, yeah. it's like, I suppose people could say that about some indie pop bands who I love, yeah. so um, that's fair enough. But yeah, I kind of... It was always you know, it was always interesting when I see the lineup of bands because you kind of kind of in your mind and you look and you think, God, oh, those headlights, you know, there was always like the proclaimers or hot yeah. house flowers and people like oh, that. I, I saw the hot house flowers and they were great. Yes, they were real festive. That was probably the afternoon one yeah. that I saw them once. But yeah, I mean they were it was just interesting that, that you know, we often say, Oh, they don't have any big bands now. And then you look back and you go, Oh right, you yeah, know, that's they were the headline, were they, in nineteen oh, eighty yeah. yeah, sort of I mean Susan Vega was the headline in on the Saturday night on nineteen eighty nine. And you're thinking, oh, okay, that's that's um yes, I probably would yeah, anyway, it's interesting, isn't it? Our memories, the way we, stories oh. we tell ourselves is quite interesting. So um yeah, they were quite amazing. I remember when I went <clears throat> just briefly, I just couldn't believe how many people were trying to sell me drugs. I just remember oh, being God, like yeah. it was was just like walking from one end to another and it was just like either side of me just shouting and I remember thinking blimey this is a bit different so um there you go yes I remember well I remember trying some space cake which I did enjoy and that was you know it was a it was good fun but I also remember being in a tent with somebody who'd actually just taken heroin and then he, he was sick and then he just collapsed. And I remember thinking, God, that's not much fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't do anything like that. But uh, <laughs> I just thought, you know, you've come all the way from Swansea to like Glastonbury and you've taken heroin and you've puked up and now you're unconscious in a tent. And that's by choice. And I remember just thinking, oh, that's a little bit weird. And funny enough, um, well, I'm not going to mention names, obviously, but I bumped into him when I was in West Wales and I was saying, remember that time? He's going, oh, yeah, I wasn't in a good place then, was I? And I was like, oh, like, oh my God, you were like 18 or 19 off your face. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, yeah, I, I don't do any." So he'd obviously partied hard, a bit too hard. <laughs> but it was just a bit like, whoa, that's really full on. Yeah, that was going straight to the A League, wasn't it? Really, oh, I, I remember the, there was a lot of scrumpy, wasn't there? There used to be a lot of. Um, oh yeah, that was that was it really. But anyway, it was all quite good. Gee, anyway, that was a bit of a detour there. I was, I just love those early festivals. They, they oh, had something. I loved them. They were just quite bonkers, really. I don't know. I mean, how they got away with it was extraordinary. Oh, I know. Um, um, so, so yeah, so the band. So you got the knock at the door, which is one of those kind of like a Morrissey yeah. and Mar moment, really, where someone just... Yeah, and I was I was really chuffed and stuff. And so we just learnt these great little pop songs and stuff. And then, you know, luckily we played them quite well. And then we went into the studio and we re- we recorded them. And I remember it was it was when MTV was suddenly becoming quite popular. Yes. So I remember being in this um, recording studio called Vons and Susie and the Banshees had been there and there was a big list of really famous people, which was like really cool. So I had lots of Banshees stuff because of my punk upbringing. Um, but then we, ju- we, you know, we just did it. And then they said, you know, do you want to make an album? And we were like, okay. So we actually recorded our, first album in Western Supermare. Um, and it went quite well. But the thing is, though, we were quite pr- prolific writing songs and stuff, especially Stuart and Simon in those days. We were all chipping in, but they were like the main guys. So when we actually toured our first album, we were only playing two songs from it. And we were playing about 12 brand new songs because we were like, we don't want to do these songs anymore. And 
in the Sarah documentary, Matt was saying, you know, and then the sweet estate came on and they sat down instead of st- standing up. And then they did two songs off Jaguar album and then 10 completely unknown songs. And we were like, what's that about? He said, but in, in hindsight, it was quite cool. So, <laughs> you know, so. Yes. Well, we love Western Supermoon. I think my parents took us to either Pontins or Butlins there in the yes. early, early 70s. I have fond memories of it. So with the album Jaguar, which came out, there are some, I mean, it's a lovely sound. I'm not sure if you like the word lovely, but it's a great sound that you developed, actually. I love that vocal and that track, the first, the opening track, which is just a gorgeous song. Briarus, that's with Louise singing. Right. It's It's, who's um, Louise, Louise? because she doesn't appear on any credits or anything, does she? I think uh, it, it might say somewhere very small on the CD. Um, special thanks to Louise. She was just um, one of the girls that we used to hang around with. And I think Simon was trying to do the vocal. And then she came along and she just nailed it really, really well. So then she was there because we had a bit of a sort of fight because we didn't make any money. Nobody made any money. We got paid. You know, when we did a gig, we'd take the takings on the door and we give half to Sarah, half to the venue. And then we'd end up with like 30 quid each or not even that, you know. Um, so that was Louise. And then she also sang on um, Tell Me How It Feels as well. Right. Which, which has just come out as a karaoke back in track on YouTube. Excellent. <laughs> it's quite funny. That is so <laughs> weird. And is that her only kind of ever recording of all? No, kind of- I've got... Um, so I, I've got some cassettes or songs that I wrote and I played guitar and she sang. So somewhere in my shed, there's a whole box of demos and stuff from me and from all the other Sweet Estate people. And she's on quite a few of those. And there's some lovely songs, actually, that I, I, I'd say I'll unearth and I'll, but I, I doubt I ever will, to be honest. So. Yeah, I know. It's quite hard to be. Yeah. Kind of, you can get motivated. One can be motivated, but, yeah. you know, you sometimes need. I mean, the album does has come, you know, it does sound good. And, and sort of decades later, it still has a beautiful quality. You must have been. Were you thrilled when you sort of yeah, heard yeah, the, the playback of it? We Yes. I mean, it's quite a mature album and it's got saxophones on it and it's got keyboards and it's got organs and stuff. I mean, I think there's like one up-tempo song, a few slow burners, and most of it's quite sort of like very chilled. And a lot of those songs actually initially started as quite upbeat songs and then we just massively slowed them down. And um, yeah, it's a mature album. I do like it. I've got... I've got it on record and I've got it on CD and my friend Caroline's actually got it on cassette. So, right. Yeah. It's a good so, one. And uh, the other song, which is is stunning, is She Believes as well. Oh, and, do you know what? I, that's probably my favourite song on the album because I just love the way it builds up at the end. And then there's that sort of flute sound, which wasn't really a flute. But it, it's a really pretty song, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just got, got a great sound. So when that came out, how many, do you know roughly how many kind of copies were sold at that stage? I, or? Think, I think it was something like about 12,000 altogether. Yeah. Um, and then we made another single then called everlasting and sickening which was like a bit of a new direction it was a bit more up tempo it was a bit brighter um and so that was good and that had really nice reviews and stuff in enemy and sounds and melody maker and vox and you know it, it was like another twee sweet steak song but this time it's a little bit more attitudey yeah. so and we, and we were all a little bit excited then and then of course then we kind of split. I mean, we made the terrible second album, which I'm not even going to talk about. But um, we split then, uh, and it was a little bit like we were a bit young, we were a bit naive. There was a little bit of trouble between two people in the band, and I'd often try, because I was the older one in the band, I'd try and say, come on, come on. But there was a little bit of, like, I don't know, friction. And then lovely Simon, who I super pals with, I just went to see The Cure with him, before Christmas, um, he's kind of quit. And as far as I'm concerned, that lovely era just died 
end of. So, that's but we've a... all worked together since. Oh, that's good. Because, yeah. the, the well, I suppose what was quite interesting, just going slightly back into the 80s, there was, the for me, you know, like between 83 to 87 was the kind of a, a certain golden period. It was also the years of the Smiths. And when oh. they split up, it was like the music kind of scene and and... And I suppose that next wave of 16, 18 year olds were coming along and they yeah. wanted their own sound and also ecstasy had appeared. And then yeah. it was that world of, you know, the Stone Roses and Primal Scream and Happy yeah, Mondays. Which I adore. And then there was, yeah, and there was like the Chicago house scene. There was a guy called Gerald. So, and the Orb and 808 State. Yeah. And so there was that kind of, suddenly festivals started getting a bit more oh, of a different sound, a soundtrack, didn't they? Remember when the Orb played one of those kind of... Well, I remember me- seeing the Orb in Glastonbury. Yes, on a um, sound. Um, oh, the whole, my God. It was... And um, funny enough, I grabbed some Orb albums. They're actually downstairs. And I listened to... Well, I listened to the band Lemon Jelly last night. I don't know if you're aware of Lemon yes. Jelly. Wonderful, wonderful band. And then I've got New Adventures. Anyway, Little Fluffy Clouds, whatever they are. And I've got a few albums downstairs um, to listen to. And because I got sort of music everywhere. You know? Yes. So yes you my do. records are downstairs. But all my my CDs and cassettes are upstairs. Yes, because it was kind of I suppose it was kind of an interesting period because a lot of those bands I loved during the eighties, like I don't know, my uh, the Mighty Lemon Drops, the Primitives, oh, you know, I love the, the, those. The, the the June Brides, and and the, all the, they all kind of yeah yeah no they all went you know we've had enough you know, no one's yeah. interested we've we're on our third album no one wants the third album so we're just going to split and you know it's kind of difficult for a band to keep kind of interested and relevant and also keep their fans going and then they, there was the Seattle kind of grunge scene yeah. that appeared as well which also you know, people were going, right, that's what the kids want. They don't want this previous stuff. So I just wondered how you felt after you'd come out with your first album, that, you know, that process of then wondering what you're going to do next. And also, yeah, I just I wondered, think... did you tour much at that stage? Were you about? Yeah, we, who... did, we did tour and stuff. And um, like, for instance, you know, we toured with people like Secret Shine, um, who are now quite a big shoegazy type band. Um, yes. And they did a, a, a shoegaze all day uh, in somewhere in London. And I was talking to them because I'm on Twitter and I'm quite prolific and I, I chat away to loads of like music people. And I, I, I just remember we'd split up. Then we made this really bad second album, which is like a Neil Young, Crosby, Stills and Nash album, which I, I don't think any of us are very proud of. And then I always wanted to just try and get the original five-piece band back together. But everyone kind of just went off on different tangents. But we we all go out together. We have a few beers. And we all went out just before Christmas. And we all just say, should we have another go? And, of course, we have beer and stuff. So, and you know, maybe one day. <laughs> we'll do something <laughs> yes so when you i mean did vinyl japan approach you i, I mean why wasn't you why weren't you sticking with sarah or well, you... oh, okay then in a nutshell so we made the second album we sent it to um sarah records and they were like no way we're not releasing this it's just like dreadful and we were like oh but we thought you know it's a bit neil young it's a bit country rock it's a bit mid-70s stones period and they were like, no, sorry. And we were like, oh, OK. And I remember feeling a bit uncomfortable about the whole thing. Um, and then Vinyl Japan basically said, oh, we like it. Um, we'll we'll promote it. And that actually sold a, a bit more. But it, <laughs> it had like dreadful reviews and stuff. And, it, you know, it, it's it's an all right album, but it, it it's just nothing like the Sarah Jingly Jangly kind of you know i liked sarah records and i liked the 60s vibes and stuff you know yes. like the urchins what a band and the field mice and stuff and and heavenly and tallulah gosh there are all just so many there's great happy bands which i kind of i was hoping our second album would be more of a sort of like love meets the birds meets the smess type of happy jingly jangly c86 album but it yes. never happened <laughs> you went for you went for heart of gold didn't you and Harvest. yeah we did massively with and it was a terrible production and it was, it was a backing vocalist and these big guitar solos like led zeppelin and and it was just like and it does i, I mean i don't want to upset anyone who's played on that album 
but it just, it, you know, I think we all feel a bit cringy. It was, it was like <laughs> Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes, sort of. Yeah, when they had their jazz, jazz fusion. Oh moment. my god! Yeah, playing live in a, I don't know, a, I don't know, a, I don't know. They, they, there's that funny scene I can't remember they're with the puppet. Some, you know, they're playing in like a theme park. Yes, there's like six people watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you put out, there was a couple of singles. They were, you know, which was on various different labels, like yeah. a new beginning. I remember Caroline and Dreaming. So yeah. were these kind of on? These weren't tracks on the album then. No, no. So I've got I've got them here. So we had I Remember Caroline. Yes. And backed with the wonderful Brown Fox. And they're on YouTube. And this is on um Watercolor Records. And I and I think that's a really strong single. And then we had um Sweet Soul Sister. And a new beginning, and that's yes. on that's on Sunday Records, which I think that's a great that's a great single as well. And then we had the really really nice. Um, this is on oh Sunday Records as well, and that's the Dreaming single. And yes. then, so if you listen to the Dreaming single, I think this is the direction I wanted to go in because it's just a great classic little psychedelic pop song all jingly jangly and i'm just gutted that we never really got that far so i have to say go. i love your your album uh, your covers are great actually, they, they, they are good aren't they i really like them no I, I can i can see that you consume the world of the smiths a bit there there you go well on that one anyway dreaming so then did you have a moment in 83 where you all sat down and and said, "This is it." To quote Jim Morrison, "This is the end." No, we never did. We all just—it's like I, I sort of formed a sort of like punky pop band. Stuart and Simon formed this kind of like a little bit like everything but the girl Eden style kind of acoustic-y band. Yes. Um, and then Simon's now in a band called Soundwire who were like a sort of psychedelic rock band, who I, I bought their first album and I went to see them live a couple of weeks ago. I've seen them a few times, but they're, they're really very good. If you're into the sort of like the ride, the My Bloody Valentine, the Stooges and stuff, and the songs are getting stronger. They've got a great drummer. But Simon is a bit like me. All Simon wants to do, he wants to concentrate on Soundwire because they're a great band and we're all friends. We all see, we all live in Swansea. It's quite a small place. So we know each other. We socialize with each other and we have little street estate nights out. Yes. But all Simon wants to do is record some new songs and say it's a sweet steak. And to do that, he just kind of needs me, him, and Stuart because we're like the core members. And then we could say it is a Sweet Estate new project. And I was with him a couple of weeks ago. We went to see The Cure. Before that, we went for a curry and a couple of pints. And he was going, like, so have you got songs? And I said, I've got loads of songs. And he said, we've got we've got to do them. And then I said to Stuart, are you going to add guitar? And he's like, yeah, go on then. See? So, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to. That's I'd like cool. to reform and do a gig and play all our Sarah records. Yes, it's got really? to be done. I know what well, Heavenly, who are bringing out their four albums this month, this yes. year, um, starting with Heavenly versus Satan. They've got a gig coming up in May, actually. Ah. Um, so, so you know, they're they're still doing things. And I know yeah. Amelia's done a, a something with Hugh from yeah, the, Swansea the, Pooh, Sound. the Swansea Sound. I was so, with them. I went to see them, and I had a lovely chat. So I've I've known Hugh's sister or girlfriend at the time natasha used to manage the sweetest steak so we right. got this thing and obviously Stuart was in the poo sticks um so we all went to see swansea sounds a couple of months ago and i was like amelia and she's going oh my god she said well, how long's the last time i saw you and i was going i don't know but you know and then we're friends on facebook and it, rob her husband's friends so i bought the swansea sound album and, it, and it's great you know it's a great album yeah. i prefer Oh, I, I don't know. Is it the Canterbury Tales? The Canterbury Wires. Have you heard the Canterbury Wires album? Oh, I think. Is this the one we can all pronounce slightly differently? The C Catenary Wires. 
Oh, could it? Yeah, it could be. It's here. Yes, that's the one. What an album. It's absolute. It, it really is. I'm going to show you again. It's such a good album. Um, so I've, I've bought that and I've got the, the Heavenly and the Tulu Lagosh albums from the first time round. Yes. So, you know, but, you know, it was a joy to see her. And it was a joy to see Hugh as well, because we've, you know, I've known Hugh for so long now because the Swansea sort of music scene and stuff, and they, they're just great. So I'm I'm hoping I can go and see um, that show of the Heavenly stuff, just because it's great to be part of that little scene, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And also <clears throat> to get enthused and, and motivated. But before... Yes, but you've also done quite a lot of music projects because there's another one called, is it Chase Petra? No, I don't know that. Oh, God, I think that's on your, okay, that's not your, <laughs> that's not your label. No, it's <laughs> under your disog- discographies. And I just thought, oh, that's interesting. You've got a few. Oh. So so anyway, you'll have to have a look at Disogs and say, no, that's not me. That must oh, be a okay. different, must be a different person with the same name. <laughs> Never mind. That's tricky. I'll edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> yes. So what does that, so musically, is it the case then that you're still just practicing and playing occasionally, but yeah. not um so me and Stuart formed a band called Summer House and we recorded a couple of songs, um, which is more jingly jangly pop and stuff. Um, and then me and other later day Sweet Estate members formed a band called the Milestone Band, which was more kind of like a bit more rocky kind of stuff. So Stuart basically just sort of says, have you got any songs? And I'm like, yeah, okay. Should we just get together? And then we get a drummer and a bass player. And we just, so Summer Summer House is, is quite a nice little project with me and Stuart. If we could just get Simon in to sing, then that would be like a mini sweet steak. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I know, it's, it's, Which I'd like. I'd like to do it. I think so. I mean, it would be amazing for the fans because I do know, did notice your um, your monthly Spotify playlist is or plays is really impressive, isn't it? You oh, know, well, that's good. You know, because, you know, with a lot of bands, you know, you go, oh, blimey, there's only 10 a month. Whereas it's like, well, you know, anybody on Sarah Records gets a lot of well, attention, do. doesn't I it? Mean, I went to see a couple of bands. Do you know the band, the Asteroid Number no. 4? No. They're, they're like an American sort of like psychedelic, you know, band. They're really very good. But before I went to see the gig, I went to this lovely record shop in Bristol. And I said, do you get any Sarah label, Sarah Records? And he said, mate, he said, they come in and they go within minutes. Right. He said, the hot stuff. And he said, how do you know them? And I said, oh, he's in a Sarah band. And he went, oh, brilliant, brilliant. So obviously in Bristol, they're quite big, aren't they? And there's a new book coming out as well um, by a lovely lady called Jane Duffs. Um, and she's just submitted her brand new book, um, which is a more detailed version than, than Pop Kiss. Right. So because she was getting in touch and stuff. So um, so that was lovely. So um, I can let you know because I've got your email now, can't I? Yeah, definitely. That would be, be great. But, I mean, I did like Pop Kiss, the Michael White book. I thought it was really yeah. sweet. And, uh, and and there was the film as well, which was quite yes. nice. I yeah. think it's just fantastic. I mean, I'm I'm amazed and impressed. There was a film came out. Well, it's still coming out. It kind of was pub, uh, released at the end of the year, but you can't really get to see it because it's, you know, I think it's only playing at film festivals. But it was about this band from 1979 called Rima Rima. They only released one EP, but it had this really big impact. And people have been fascinated with this band called Rima Rima. And then oh. they they the members went on to ver- form various kind of bands for Four AD records. Basically, oh, they were the I first. They were the first band on Four AD, Rima Rima. So do check them out. And then you know one of the members had got some you know cassettes and compilations. So they put an, uh, a collection out recently. And then suddenly there's been this kind of fantastic in, you know interest. And you're thinking, God, that's over forty four years ago. Oh, I know. I know. It, it's it's interesting that these the, you know people start discovering stuff. And I would imagine with anything from Sarah, you know, there's a kind of a global interest, isn't there? I think so. There's a new Cherry Red um, compilation. It's a four CD compilation. And there's a Sweet Estate song on it called If I Could Shine, which is probably our, our finest moment. 
Um, but that's really good that Cherry Reg have, have said, oh, yeah, we'll add it. And it's got things like the Cocteau Twins. It's got a, a huge list of amazing songs oh. by super famous bands. I think it's got things like Slow Dive on it and Curve and and then, you know, maybe even the Cocteau Twins. And then it's got on, on I think it's on disc four. It's like the sweetest steak if I could shine. So that that's exciting. And we've also been on a, on a few little indie compilations as well like random sweet estate songs so it is great if it's tiny if it's spreading a little bit of the music isn't it yes well i know cherry red's done these compilations that they there was just a c86 cassette and then they did a you know a triple cd and then they went from that up to 91 and now they're yeah. going back to yeah they just released 19 c85 and i hope they'll keep going back yeah until so they're, they're so big. good aren't they yes you've got things like the shop assistants and the bmx bandits and you just get so many gems on all these because i remember buying um c86 i've got you know the the original album and i've got the cassettes as well from yes. the SMB. um and i remember buying pillows and prayers you know the cherry red compilation yes that's right you know, like this mortal coil and you'd just buy stuff because it was on 4ad you know like the cocteau twins and stuff it was just yes. such an amazing label I know there was the was it Dead Can Dance and then yeah, and then the colour box and then suddenly it was throwing muses and the pixies. It was yeah, very exactly. sort of it was a kind of one of those go to to uh, sort of labels, which is, sounds good. So yeah, I will look at. I think that's a shoegazing one that they're bringing out next yeah, year. Yeah, which isn't I'm, it? I'm quite excited about that because you know I I love like Ride and My Bloody Valentine and and I've got a Chapter House album here as well and you know it was just a great era for so many very good bands and stuff yes it was. i'm excited to be you know on that yes well i'm not surprised because they always yeah. do good booklets as well actually which yeah. is quite fascinating and i know with the c85 there were kind of they often get flexi discs as well which you know yeah, have yeah. been really hard to get hold of especially now and they've kind of managed to remaster them and put them on so I love the I love the world of archiving. I think this is this is the most oh, important thing ever. So if you could have if you could have whispered something to your like sixteen year old self starting out, is there anything that you would have thought? Oh yes, I would have I would have just told that person that little bit of advice or some bit of wisdom, even if that person just said, "Yeah, forget it, Granddad. I'm not interested in your." No, I, I I I just think that when. The, the first lineup of the Sweet steak was when Simon was leaving. I wish I'd have just said, no, you're not leaving. Get it together and let's just make a, a second album or a third album and let's just have a go. And I think we all just regret the way we went in our ridiculously rock direction. Um, no, that's my only thing, I think. And it makes us all feel quite sad that we made like quite a mature first album you know, six lovely little singles. And I think we could have made a really good, and I've got, we've got demos of some lovely unreleased, you know, proper lineup, Sweet Estate songs. And I I just wish that we'd made a second album and pursued it a little bit better and not let egos and stroppy teenagers get in the way. So yeah just yeah. keep trying just keep trying you've got to yeah but I can see the photograph. Everyone's got very floppy hair, haven't they? And bees. Yes, yeah. I got I got hundreds of photos. Which one are you in this kind of the picture? That's kind of it's a bit of a fish eyed photo, and they and you're all looking I've at the camera. I probably got like a, a sort of short. It, it, I don't know, probably like a triangle. I don't know, similar hair. Now. I don't know. <laughs> can you show me the photo, and then I can tell you. Oh, oh well, actually, I could tricky. I could see if I can get it up on this. Actually, I was just kind of curious because because it's on this dig this old page and i was thinking oh, which one you are on there i know it's funny with that because often there's the picture of the band when they're very young and you're thinking mm, no one looks like that anymore do they yeah um so oh, sweetest i'm it's nervous i think i've got a black leather jacket on if it's the disog i'll see if i wait a minute i'll just see if i can get this kind of no, you little sweetheart Yes, I know. When you ever try and do something fast, it always goes the sweetest. Hey, come on, just that can't be that tricky. I'm looking now. Oh, yeah. Oh, here you I are. I got to the Discogs page. Can you see that? Yeah, so I am. So 
I am the one. I'm the one. Oh, God. See the guy. What's this now? How to add. Are you the one with the, the stripy? With the white... See the guy with the white T-shirt on? Yes. I'm behind him. And my ah. hair's a little bit in, in my face. I see. Yes, I got it. <laughs> it's classic, isn't it? <laughs> you do, by the way, all look incredibly young. Well, we were. I mean, and I was probably about 20 then. And they were all about, well, no, I was about 21. They were maybe like 17, 18, 19. You know, we're all still very young, of course. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, this is good. Yes, I know. This is true. We all are. As long as you've got indie pop in your veins, that's yes, the main I thing, am. isn't it? <laughs> Never shifted. Well, look, Peter, this has been amazing. Thank you ever so much. Oh, no, my pleasure. If you want, I can always send you the the link to the interview and uh, you can always put it up because you wouldn't believe how excited people around the world get, you know, when they go, oh, my God, I I never heard that person talk before. All that back. Or, you know, I get a lot of people sort of strangely in America, you know, you know, who were on some college rock radio, you know, in, in the day. And they were like, oh, wow, there's all these bands. I can just vaguely remember that, that I'm, I seem to be interviewing. So they get very, they, they kind of quite like it, which is, which is good. Because I think with a lot of bands, you know, everyone's heard the interview, so you don't really need it. But well, I'm, I'm really specialised and I think that's the key to life. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Oh, no, please send me a link because I've got a few friends who live in like sort of like Toronto. There's a girl called Lisa Hanna who has a sort of like indie pop, shoegazy show when she played the sweetest steak which was lovely and she, you know she'll play the cure and the smiths and the pixies and whoever but she she said i'm gonna play the sweetest steak if i could shine because it's one of my all-time favorite songs and i was just like oh that's so, so cool so she sent me the link and i listened to her and it was really nice and she went okay and now we're gonna play i have a good friend called peter stone and i'm gonna play you know and i was just like oh what a delight so yes please send me the link and then I can send it to some of my pals yes definitely definitely well look thank you and also I've been loving your photographs you put on Twitter by the way oh good that's my yeah I I I tend to so I I work with people with addiction and part of my job is to get them out and about so we go for these random walks on a Monday and a Tuesday um so I always take photos um and then it's usually this is what album I'm listening to now you know, or sometimes if I've had a few drinks, it's like, here I am with a paint in my hand. So excellent, thank well, no. you. Thank you. I, I do love the photographs. They've got such oh, a beautiful, la- lovely landscapes. I do live in well. I live in South Wales, um, in a place called Mumbles, and we and we got the Gower Peninsula, and it is very pretty where I live. So thank you for saying that. Yes. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview. A massive thank you to Peter Stone for giving me the time. Um, yes, if you want to find out any more information about The Sweetest Egg, you can go to, yes, well, I'm not sure if they've got a Facebook page, but they definitely are on Discography, so you'll find out more about that. And um, yes, just Google away, that will be the main thing. And also, yes, Sarah Records, they have the book, Pop Kiss, and also the film. This has been the C86 Show. If you want to contact me for some groovy reason, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. All these have been archived, so you can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.